with Roller Girl, everything is improvised. Everything. I rehearsed with the two cops who, who are trained actors, and I told them the shtick about the scene. This is where we kind of need to go, or this is what we're thinking about. But at the end of the day, it, it really was Roller Girl in the driver's seat, because every time you put the camera on, you know, I give her a direction or two, but she's the one literally running the show. The winner of this year's DGC Discovery Award. He's a bold new voice in Canadian filmmaking. Uh, metaphorically or literally? <laughs> Luck Lucky is the Hunkamanum name for the area known today as the downtown east side. Um, in contrast to Vancouver, this is an area that has thousands of years of international history. And so by foregrounding that title, my intention was to bring that issue to the fore because the film doesn't quite explicitly, um, I guess, showcase issues of colonialism. However, each different kind of exploitation that the actors in my film are subjugated to intersect in some way, shape, or form with the legacy of colonialism that is still ongoing today in this land. So that was the intention behind the name Luck Lucky. I mean, there's a mix of non-professionals, um, non-actors, and some talented actors such as Ken Harrower, who's a local from here, um, and Joe Dion Buffalo, who you might recognize from Hello Destroyer. Um, I think that the central point, however, is that each of these individuals has a very intimate and personal connection to their character. Um, Ken, for example, is just playing himself, literally. And uh, Joe is playing somebody who's both himself and somebody who passed away in the lead up to the production of the film. Um, my decision to work with these individuals to tell their real stories was to collaborate with people from the community who have faced these issues because reciprocity has always been an integral part of my process and I believe should be an integral part of everybody's process. And so by foregrounding the non-actors and non-professionals that are participating in the movie, my intention was to foreground them as collaborators and artists. If you have a chance, uh, go Google Roller Girl's YouTube channel. It's prolific and legendary. Uh, that's not a joke. True. It, it, it is. And um, she's on it every day. She's running for mayor in Vancouver, actually, just so you know. So she goes around rampaging Vancouver with her GoPro, like directing traffic, harassing the pigs, because fuck the pigs, and does her thing with her GoPro. And so I thought that it actually, the scene itself was, with her input, fictionalized off of a real event, obviously, which... She she had the GoPro and was um, she gives it to people frequently and she she I remember one video where she did this during the Olympics and had somebody film her like in front of the Scotiabank the Theater on Burrard and uh, that's actually in the movie so that's that cutaways that's the the YouTube video from which that scene in my movie is inspired and so I thought that it would be a good opportunity to do that to provide agency and subjectivity to her to have her and she actually ended up directing that scene as well. Then the latter part of the scene where she actually starts to beat up the hockey dudes, that's where it starts to get a little fictional because that actually ties into her actual life story when she was arrested by the cops um, and was um, discriminated against because of her gender. So that's where the two kind of come hand in hand and it provided a good vehicle for me to actually hybridize those, those facets. Yeah, so in that example, when she's sitting in the back of the cop car, and there's that dialogue. How much of that is improvised? Was that a story she told you that you transcribed and then it was recreated, or how did that work? With Roller Girl, everything is improvised. Everything. The actors are in the hot seat. So yes, the scene is based on, on real events. She was indeed um, arrested. The, the, the actual arrest as it went down was a lot more violent. Um, the pigs threw her against the wall. And a male cop searched her and ended up throwing her into the male jail when she got taken down to the pound. And we we ended up not be not wanting to do that on the day because of you know the the idea of bringing up past trauma. And I wanted to make sure that it was a somewhat controlled environment and a safe environment for her. 
And so we, we had her in the back of the cop car and I rehearsed with the two cops who, who are trained actors and I told them the shtick about the scene. This is where we kind of need to go or this is what we're thinking about. But at the end of the day, it, it really was Roller Girl in the driver's seat because every time you put the camera on, you know, I give her a direction or two, but she's the one literally running the show on set and there's nothing I can do about that. And I ended up learning to embrace that for better or for worse. And so it was her actually just running the gun actually driving them it was them reacting to her and that's how we approached most of the scenes with her in the movie there's a lot of sensitive material and in a scene like for example when she's breaking down or when eric um, looks directly into camera and and breaks down can you talk about those scenes a little bit um and how you discuss them beforehand and how you shoot them how many times you shoot them what the feeling is afterwards how you create the atmosphere and work with your crew can you talk about those two specifically? So, yeah. So with those scenes, like there's certain fundamental rules with the way that we approach them. Like it's a it's a close set, for example. So Jeremy, it might be the only person in the room, you know, aside from me. With Roller Girl in the jail scene, it was just me and the camera and her, because um, we had discussed that scene a number of times before we went to camera, but we'd never actually rehearsed it because I knew of how how sad it would make her. Um, she herself actually was able to distance herself from the reality of the event, like, like very courageously. So she, she actually didn't have any qualms with like the, the event that we're fictionalizing being, uh, resonant with like things that have actually happened to her. She was fully capable of like real, of, like adopting like an actor's persona with that. The, the trouble was, however, the substitution involved. So the, the story that she told me in order to invoke the sadness required, was something that was private between us. And so I knew I didn't need or want any other crew involved to hear that story. So that was a very private moment that, that her and I shared in order to, to get her to arrive at that space, which she herself was entirely um, in agreement with, right, to, to make the scene happen. Um, with Eric, it was Jeremy and me in the room with him. Again, it was a close set because I knew that Eric's a very vulnerable and, and sensitive person. Frequently, he thinks that if you're laughing along with him, you're making fun of him, which is it's certainly not the case, but he definitely gets in his head about that, so I knew I wanted to nip that in the butt and make sure that we were in a very safe and controlled environment. Of course, he had read the script and we had collaborated on it, so he knew it was coming, but still has, was quite nervous about it. So I just, again, we invoked the, the tool of substitution and the sharing of a very personal story with him in order to have him arrive at that space. And so I knew that, that that was not something that I needed other people nor wanted other people hearing. Yeah. 